We're going to uh, move to the real experts. Don't tell those guys I said that. They just, they just, just laughed. But, but uh, the, uh, we really do have an uh, expert panel here. And what, remember that uh, Twitter tag now, unthinkable. Uh, what, what we're going to do here, uh, I'm going to just introduce each of these guys right now. I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the two sentence version again, and then we're going to. I'm going to ask them to speak, and they already know this for just four or five minutes. Initially, I'm going to uh, enforce that so we can go through that and then have an interactive discussion, and then have questions uh, from the audience uh, as well as their own questions to each other. So, feel free to think of questions, uh, please. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do, uh, the way the order I'm going to proceed in, uh, uh, is this. I'm going to ask uh, Michael Weinberg to speak first because he's has a different view from what you've heard thus far, and he's and, and he sat patiently and and listened to it all, and and I appreciate him being here. I've uh, we've had the chance to engage on these issues before, and I. Always enjoy do that and doing that, and I'm and uh, I'm very glad you're here. So Michael's going to go first, and then we're just going to go in alphabetical order down down the line, and then once we've done that, I'm going to come back uh, uh, to Michael again and let him uh, have the first crack at responding uh, to some of what's said. I think that makes sense. Uh, so uh, let me. Uh, just do this in the in the order that I have people here. Uh, Bob Crandall is a uh, longtime old friend of mine. We're both old enough, I can say that, <laughs> I think. Uh, and uh, Bob is a uh, non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, and he's also a member of the Free State Foundation's Board of Academic Advisors, which I appreciate. Uh, and then uh, next, and just in my chart, is uh, uh, Deborah Taylor Tate. Uh, Debbie, as all of you know, she's, uh, you might think I'd say first that she's a um, former FCC commissioner, which she is, but she's also a distinguished adjunct senior fellow at the Free State Foundation, so, so we'll say that as well. Uh, then, uh, uh, Jerry uh, Fallhaber, uh, and this is the first time I've uh, been privileged to have uh, Jerry here, and I appreciate him being here. He's a Professor Emeritus of Business, Economics, and Public Policy uh, and of Management at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and he served as Chief Economist of the FCC. Uh, and then finally, Michael, who's going to step up here in just a minute. Uh, Michael is Vice President of Public Knowledge, and uh, says on his resume he oversees PK Thinks, uh, a place to explore long-term trends and anticipate policy challenges. So Michael, why don't you, and all of you can, you can uh, either come here or you can speak from there if you want to. It's up to you. I'm happy to. I'm sitting already. I might as well keep sitting here. Hold over, hold over a mic. Uh, well, so first of all, thank you so much, Randy, for, for having me. Uh, I always appreciate invitations to your events and the, the writ of safe passage that I get to, to come here uh, and talk, talk to people. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be presumptuous and assume that if you came out at 8.30 or 9 in the morning uh, for, for this event, you at least have heard of public knowledge, so I won't give you the spiel. Um, and, and I just I want to talk a little bit about net neutrality and how we think about this. And I know that we're going to get into the details in this panel, and so as a kind of initial matter, I want to just go back to first principles a little bit and talk about why we're engaged with, with this policy conversation and why we are advocating what we're advocating. And, and first principles really are pretty basic, right? We are concerned, and, and net neutrality advocates, I can't speak for all of them, but as a representative, <laughs> I will I'll do my best, are concerned about ISP gatekeeper power, 
are concerned that ISPs have the ability and the incentive to basically inject themselves into the internet experience, inject themselves into the conversation, and manipulate success or failure of services, sites uh, online. And that's true in kind of a commercial innovation sense, which is a very important part of this conversation. And then it can also have kind of side effects on all of the, the non-commercial activity that really gives the internet its richness. And you know, we talk a lot about the, the commercial innovative part of this, and I think it's, that's really important, and we're going to talk about that a lot. But it is worth kind of taking a moment and stepping back and thinking about everyone's own private internet experience. You know, we all, we all use big name services. We, you know, we go to, to, to Politico or New York Times or these sites. But a lot of people also have these online communities that are not commercial and they're different for everyone, but they really give a richness to the experience. And so many of these experiences, communities, some of them commercial, some of them not, the reason they exist is because of this open nature of the internet, and that's what they're fighting to do. I mean, that's why we've seen all these startups. We've seen what, four million comments, I believe the vast majority of which are calling for very strong rules. That's what they're really motivated by. So once, you're, once you start from there, you say, okay, well, what, what does that mean in terms of rules? What does that mean in terms of rules? It means bright line rules that make it clear things like no blocking, things like no discrimination, that have clear lines. And then you say to yourself, if you are then sitting in Washington and in the policy fight, okay, well, what did we learn? What have we learned from history? What have we learned from the DC circuit this year about what's necessary to really have those bright line rules? And the answer, the takeaway, certainly from the DC circuit decision, is that if you want clear bright line rules, you have to ground FCC authority in Title II. You can have other rules that are not grounded in Title II authority, but if you're serious about really robust open internet rules, that's where you have to go. Now, I wish that that was not the case, honestly. Um, if it was possible to have strong net neutrality rules under a 706 authority, we probably wouldn't be having this event. We would have moved on, we would have all moved on with our lives and we'd be doing other things. But for better or worse, where we are right now is if you really want clear, bright line rules that strongly protect an open internet, you have to go with Title II authority. That's why we were very encouraged that President Obama came out and said that. We were very encouraged. Uh, we were a little bit concerned when uh, Chairman Wheeler uh, expressed concern about President Obama's position. We were encouraged that uh, later on in the week, he, the, the, the FCC walked that concern back a little bit, and we hope now that they're taking a very serious look at Title II options. And uh, we recognize that Title II, like any rulemaking proceeding, I think under and any rules under 706, under Title II, under hybrid, there are questions to be answered. We think we have answered those questions, but I will not pretend that there is, there's simply nothing that anyone could worry about. Um, but that's, that's just kind of an overview of, of where we're coming from. So can we start from a place where we want to maintain a, a free and open internet uh, that requires bright line rules that makes it clear to everyone involved uh, where, where the lines are, where the rules are. And in order to do that, you need to ground that in Title II authority. And so with that, um, I will be quiet for a little while. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Michael. And you, you'll have a chance to be unquiet again. Uh, <laughs> I always take those shortly. chances. Uh, so now what I'm going to do, uh, as I said, is what we're going to go down the line. And so I'm going to ask Bob uh, to take five, five minutes or so, and then we'll move down the line. Bob? Uh, as Randy pointed out, I'm a non-resident uh, senior fellow at Brookings. I'm also, by the way, a non-resident senior fellow at uh, uh, Tom Leonard's uh, Technology Policy Institute. He's a, he's not, a non, he doesn't have a no, residence in any yeah, place. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a resident because I moved up to northern New Hampshire thinking there was nothing left to do in regulation of telecom. 
Um, and after listening to Commissioners uh, Pye and, and O'Reilly, I'm, I'm uh, convinced, except for one thing, they continue to talk about the expansion of high-cost universal service and the E-rate program. There's absolutely no evidence that either one of those programs has had any beneficial effect on anyone, and they should be eliminated. Uh, so they could just say no, uh, and, and we can move ahead. That's not an argument against net, neut net neutrality regulation. Um, I was surprised at the, uh, the evolution of the net neutrality uh, debate to uh, this paid prioritization notion and the notion that somehow uh, termination of incoming internet traffic at, at uh, uh, broadband distributors should always be priced at zero. This is a two-sided market. Uh, the, the, uh, the distributors can collect revenues from their subscribers or from the incoming traffic. I know of no empirical evidence that suggests that setting the termination rate at zero uh, is, is beneficial, is, is well for maximizing. I'll let Jerry Fallhaber address this too if he wants. He's a better economic theorist perhaps than I am. But I know of no such evidence. Uh, it is, you can speculate about why that might be the case, but I doubt that you can find parameters that will, that will work to tell you that that is the right price. Um, secondly, there's no need to be worried about the distributors excluding um, uh, marginally valuable content from innovative providers at the edge of the Internet. They have no incentive to do so. Indeed, if they have market power, they will erect discriminatory tariffs and charge those guys very little while charging very high prices to those people who distribute through Netflix and the like. Um, uh, products that are produced in Hollywood with huge rents and I would predict that the effect of doing so will be not to reduce the market value of Netflix, not to increase the cost uh, to uh, subscribers, but rather to reduce the rents of Tom Cruise and his brethren in Hollywood. Uh, that's where, that, because there are huge rents being earned uh, in the production of those products that Netflix is distributing. Maybe that's the reason why President Obama decided to get active in this, because a large number of those people are obviously Democratic supporters. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the ti imposing Title II is going to create enormous problems, as you just heard. First, I don't see how a any uh, hearing on what the appropriate termination rates should be is going to result in any, any, any uh, easy resolution that they should be zero for all incoming internet traffic to now Title II regulated distributors. In fact, I have colleagues in the economics profession who are already trying to scare up uh, 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 business in Europe because they figure this is going to be a great excuse for le uh, loading on substantial fees for Google and the like in, the, in Europe. Uh, so I don't see uh, how this going this direction is likely to lead to the result that the advocates want, that is zero prices on the terminating side of, of uh, internet traffic coming into the distributors. But more importantly, I, I think our two, uh, the two commissioners uh, understated the problems here. The FCC has never regulated individual tariffs through a cost-based proceeding, or at least the times they have tried, they failed to come up with a solution. Uh, for the most part, uh, uh, Title II regulation is imposed before the breakup of AT&T, uh, involved a, uh, a process for which the state and, and federal regulators divvied up the costs of, of, uh, of the Bell operating systems and, and decided how much should go to the state uh, jurisdiction, how much to the federal jurisdiction. They didn't re regulate individual rates. Once they admitted entry into long-distance services, they had to begin to regulate because AT&T started offering different private line prices to business customers, and a TELPAC proceeding began in which they had to, the com commission had to determine whether the rates were discriminatory or not. This started in 1961. The TELPAC proceeding terminated in 1981 without any result. That is, the FCC never approved a single telcap, telpac tariff. And for those of that, that's history that many of you don't know anything about probably. But today, the special access proceeding is going down the same road. We're approaching year 10 in the special access proceeding, and we're just beginning to collect data. Needless to say, once you get the data, given the, the, the pervasive nature of joint and common costs in telecom platforms now that deliver video, voice, and data services, uh, the, the attempt to tease out what is the cost 
of special access is going to be involved in just enormous controversy, uh, no matter what data or wh which econom econometricians are used to try to do it. Remember the, the old uh, uh, cable regulation of the 92 Cable Act, how well that went. So I think it, this is going to just embroil us in a nightmare of very long proceedings, uh, which will not be easily uh, resolved and, and no one will have much certainty about. And I don't think that's the way you want to go about regulating the, the Internet to make sure that you get innovative, new, uh, wonderful products coming from the edge uh, of the Internet to, uh, to subscribers. Bob, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that. And now I'm going to turn to Jerry, please. Thank you. First of all, I hope um, uh, whether you agreed with our commissioners that spoke before, I think you could probably all join me in thinking that we have a couple of guys on this commission that understand what the issues are. These are smart guys. I was very pleased with that. Uh, let me talk about network neutrality really quickly. Um, this is supposed to be the issue here, network neutrality. Um, and one of the things that came out of the FCC order that eventually got overturned um, was the fact that in 10 years, of uh, broadband ISPs, we had exactly two incidents which could demonstrably and provably violate network neutrality. One was the Madison River Telephone Company and the other was Comcast blocking a BitTorrent. Two events out of a decade of industry history uh, that we would think of as negatively seems to be uh, a reason that you should commend the industry, not the reason you should bring them under, under regulation. In fact, the FCC used the term, um, uh, indicated that they were adopting these regulations um, simply to make sure nothing happened that might happen but hadn't actually been proven to happen. And I think Bob Crandall put it very well. These guys are in business to carry traffic. They're not in the business to stop it. And the evidence that we have strongly suggests that's what they were doing. Okay, so the immediate impact of the, of the Internet order was, uh, was actually zero. And the FCC did the right thing. They said, we're going to adopt what is current industry practice. Okay, and that's what they did, and nothing happened. Now, the intermediate impact, I think, was, was, um, was kind of somewhat negative, okay? Uh, forbidding ISPs from offering differentiated services, so-called paid prioritization, which seems to get people really riled up. And I, I just think it's silly, okay? I usually come down here from Philadelphia on the Acela, which is called a fast track railroad, okay? And, and it's, it's a, you know, it's a regular, it's a utility, right? Public utility, common carrier. <laughs> And um, uh, so I guess we're going to have to do without the Acela from now on, okay? Um, also, I get notices from people via the post office, talk about something that's regulated, it's the post office, by express mail, which is the fast track mail, I guess. I mean, that's what it is. Okay, but generally speaking, so, you know, come on. We do this in every part of our lives, and we do it with regulated utilities and common carriers. It's just standard practice of the way we all live. Why are we so upset about this? What's going on? Um, the other thing is imposing restrictions now to keep the internet as is. Come on, this works for telephone in 1930 when it was a mature technology. This is not a mature technology. It's not even close to it. And saying, okay, we're gonna freeze it the way it is. This is it. We don't need any more innovation, do we? We don't need any, we don't, we don't wanna let this thing evolve for God's sakes, that's terrible. Okay, but that's the intermediate term. The long-term impact is really disastrous. Now, be clear, the FCC has started to regulate the Internet after 40 years of hands-off. And being very proud of hands-off. Do you remember the term unregulate? Okay, back in the, in the 90s and 2000s, it was like, you know, the reason it's so successful is we're not regulating. <clears throat> when do we change our mind here? What does history tell us about regulation? Now, we've heard a lot about that today. Okay, but there's sort of two general principles I want you to think about. And think about the, 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 what you've heard about today as data. The first thing is regulation, when it's introduced into an industry, will eventually expand to the entire industry. You may say, oh, it's just ISPs today. Whoops, now it's ISPs and how they interact with uh, peering networks. Okay, 
One of the things you might have noticed, Netflix doesn't realize this yet, but pretty soon they're going to be regulated. Google, I think, has kind of cottoned on to the fact they were very strong advocates of network neutrality and regulation. I'm beginning to believe they understand eventually they will be regulated. That will happen. It's, if you look at the history of regulation, this is what goes on. The second thing, and we've seen this already, it provides wide opportunities for rent seeking. It's an economics phrase basically saying, people who are in this business now no longer go to customers to get their competitive advantage. They go to regulators. They go to regulators to say, put some restrictions on my competitors. Give me special treatment. So su competitive success comes from going to Washington to the regulator's office. And we've already seen this, OK? We've seen it with Light Squared. We've seen it with Level 3. We've seen it with Nextel. We've seen it with Cogent. That's what goes on, OK? Um, it's well underway. Network neutrality, which started off to be just about ISPs and customers, um, became the opening wedge for bringing interconnection uh, with peering networks and others um, under the FCC's wing. After 30 years of evasive, basically very successful private, private markets working, you know, interconnection amongst networks just worked fine. All work with contracts. Now all of a sudden, we've expanded it. Okay. Now, uh, uh, this has been pointed out before. You want to see what this looks like? Look at the EU. Okay. Let's name all the great innovations in the internet that have come out of the EU. Right. Um, that, that's what's going to happen. Okay, if Jeff Culver were here today, he would tell you this. He went to the FCC and said, which you're going to get to, if you want to introduce, if you want voice over IP to be under Title II, guess what? We're not doing it and nobody else will. And they issued the Pulver Order, which said, well, okay, it's an information service. He was very clear about it, and he's very clear today, as, he, as you'll see. Okay, uh, Title II versus Section 6. Let's make it clear. 706. Seven, what did I say? Six. But oh, 706. Okay. I don't know uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's make it clear. We're going down the regulatory rat hole. It's a rat hole. And that's where we're going. Title, we've heard about Title II and how, oh, well, we're going to forbear from stuff. Okay. All that means. Uh, and then 706, well, that's going to be, you know, we're going to have to adopt things. The only difference is how fast we get down the rat hole. We'll go down faster with Title II, but we're going down the regulatory rat hole. Whether it's two years or five years, that's where we're going, okay? That's where we're going. Now, I don't even want to talk about Obama's intervention. That was just embarrassing at every possible public policy level. Uh, I do want to mention wireless, and this came out too in some of the talks. If we had a lot of wireless out there, so we had a lot of broadband, wireless broadband providers, because people are willing to enter wireless broadband, we would not have any problem like this, because we'd have a competitive broadband market. Okay? Guess who hasn't put the spectrum out there to give us competitive wireless broadband? It's the FCC, the NTIA. There is spectrum out there. There's a lot of it. It's not getting out there. It's taken them an age to get stuff out. And they just seem to think this can take a couple of decades, and it's OK. Well, if we had a lot of wireless out there, a lot of broad we'd have a competitive broadband market. OK? And we don't have that. And go back to the FCC. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to Commissioner uh, Tate. Uh, and then, Michael, I'm going to ask you to come back after uh, Commissioner Tate, okay? Thank you, and thank you, Randy. I thought the discussion so far was great. And, Michael, I want you to know, often when I was here, I was David in the lion's den, too. So <laughs> we welcome you, and we're thank thankful you. that you're here to provide some, uh, some other remarks. Um, I guess a couple of things that I wanted to say, and Gerald set this up nicely for me, so I thought I would be the Carl Rove of Free State Foundation today. And so I dropped my pen over there. This should also have Madison River on it. But some of 
you may not remember that this goes all the way back to the original blocking. It was Verizon and this NARAL. Um, they weren't sending text messages, I think, about um, right of choice or something. This was before I got to the FCC, when I was still a state commission. And then, of course, Madison River, and then, of course, BitTorrent. So my question is, where is the beef? And unless and until we really have a true complaint at the FCC, I think it's hard for me to understand what the exact problem is. And that's what I kept saying while I was at the FCC, and, and not some hypothetical what if, but what is the real problem that occurred so that you could then create a rule that would address that very real problem to borrow uh, Commissioner Pye a clear and present danger, if you will. And so I thought that Commissioner O'Reilly did a spectacular job of analyzing Title II and the impact on that. And one of the things that Michael probably doesn't know is that I was a state commissioner and the chairman of our state PUC. And so back to some of the issues that both Robert and Gerald brought up, you know, to think about going back to the stacks of dockets that I have seen over the past um, 10, 15, 20 years now being applied to ISPs is just absolutely unbelievable for me. Now, on the other hand, great for everybody in this room. I mean, look, you have 20 more years of really productive billable hours coming. Um, you know, but that is concerning as well. Um, so where is the beef? And at this point, I'm at the beef is zero. Um, and then something is rotten in not Denmark, although we could talk about Denmark and all their regulation as well, but something is rotten in Silicon Valley. So sometimes when you're at the FCC, you actually wonder, why is somebody here asking to be regulated, right? And I've always found it very interesting that these are the same folks that I found so difficult to try to get a meeting with because I could see that their products and um, their infrastructure and their um, competitive services at one day would intersect with consumers, with all of us, and possibly with the FCC. So I really wanted to try to build a relationship. As you all remember, um, really no one from Silicon Valley even had an office in Washington, nor did they think they needed one. So now I think it's interesting that now they are the biggest provider of lobbying services in uh, D.C. Um, you know, not to mention that now Facebook, I think if you look at the population alone and you looked at it as a nation, would be either third, fourth, or fifth in the country. So under the regulatory regime that we have now, we all see the explosion, the transformation, the unbelievable opportunities that are right here at the touch of a fingertip. Um, and also, so the other question is, they really don't want to pay for what they use, right? They want up, us to both provide all of our data, which they then sell to advertisers, and now they're also wanting price regulation, which, as you all heard, even Tim Wu, who is a huge net neutrality proponent, has said, the consumer always pays. Um, the third point I wanted to make is a cost-benefit analysis, and this is something that Commissioner O'Reilly brought up as well. Um, and so did the commission, will the commission actually look at what the cost of regulation is, what the cost of compliance will be? You heard a whole list of what Title II could possibly mean to everyone in this ecosystem. The potential filings, the data capture, the FCC's constant request for information, um, having to appear before the FCC. And then I was so thrilled that um, both commissioners got into the additional cost of um, USF. I really don't know. Are the Silicon Valley folks, are 
all, all of the net neutrality advocates, have you really thought about the cost that's going to be imposed when you indeed have to contribute to this USF program that, as uh, one of the commissioners says, is now at 16 percent, and that they are getting ready to go on uh, a spending spree? I think that's how. Commissioner O'Reilly um, articulated it. And then finally, I really share Congressman Latta's concerns. And many of you all know that I do have a role as it relates to children with the ITU, and I'm very proud of that, but that our actions speak louder than our words. And I've said this before, I'm very proud that the FCC truly is looked at as the gold standard. I went to many countries, and one of the reasons that we were out there was to talk about having an independent regulator. So an autocrat just didn't choose their cousin or their brother to run the ministries of telecom uh, in, and information now. Um, and so I think it is very important about our actions speaking louder than our words. We cannot go out and tell the world not to censor and not to regulate certain content when we ourselves possibly may be doing just that. So I share that concern. And then finally, um, I think that Randy may uh, did you talk about your meeting that you joined uh, Jesse Jackson? Because I think it's also interesting to see some of the people who have come out for, uh, if you want to go down the, the, ro the, the road of regulation at all, the 706 pathway, and that includes 50 civil rights organizations, because they are much more concerned about the investment in the infrastructure, about reaching the underserved and unserved, about reaching the millions of children that are not connected in their homes today. Um, and so I share those concerns as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Debbie. Uh, some of you have heard me say this uh, before, but I'll say it again that, uh, as Debbie alluded to briefly, she, since leaving the commission, and that's been a while now, she is you know, spent a lot of time, she's devoted uh, a lot of her time to advocating uh, for children uh, and especially, uh, you know, the things that go on on the internet and, and generally proposing uh, and advocating market-based solutions and not, not regulation and more information and more parent involvement and so forth. And I, you know, it's, we, it's not the heart of what we do at the Free State Foundation, but I'm always, uh, you know, I'm proud uh, to have her associated with Thank that. Thank you. Randy, so, tell me I couldn't talk about that, so I'm so glad you just I, did an ad. I said this was not that program, right? <laughs> but, but I am, am proud of it. Now, here's what we're going to do. I like to keep everyone apprised. I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, give Dan the mic, because I'm sorry Jeff wasn't here. And Jerry alluded to it, and I'm, you don't get the full five minutes. I just want you to take... Just a minute to uh, make a comment about what Jeff wanted yeah. to say. Uh, just one minute. Uh, Jeff really wanted to be here, and I will pass all your good wishes on to him. I just wanted to sort of say why Jeff has conviction about, you know, arguing against Title II. Um, and I met Jeff 20 years ago in 1995 when I was at Bell Laboratories, and this, this random guy came up and was working on something called Voice over IP. And uh, we started a project that would connect um, PC to PC to the telephone network. So immediately, so this is before the 96 Act, and so we've talked a lot about um, hypothetical versus real, and so Jeff had the real experience of Title II in communications. The moment he connected um, VoIP as PC to PC to the PSDN, he heard nothing but, that is illegal. You need to go ask permission of the FCC to do that. Now, Jeff, the thing that Jeff reminds us is that this is really all about communication in the end. Jeff looks at the regulatory, he looks at the technology, he's like, this is just a black box to me. He, all he cares about as a super communicator is, you know, what is the communication capacity that I'm getting? And so he'll sit here today and he'll say, well, in 1996, before all this started, um, communication was, you know, a 40 cent long distance phone call and taking an airplane flight somewhere so you could go talk to someone. Um, today we have many, many more ways of communicating and, and that's what Jeff wants to pr uh, protect and, and also his sleepless nights. So he didn't want in those days in 1995 to be a lawbreaker. Uh, and so, you know, we told Jeff, well, 
If you make it free, Jeff, and call it free world dial-up, they can't get you. Uh, but it still took 10 years to get the Pulver order and get the FCC to admit that, well, okay, it's not Title II. So 10-year process, Jeff left for 10 years, came back this summer, and all of a sudden it's back again. But that's it. Okay, well, that, uh, it's good to have that historical uh, perspective that some people might not be aware of. Thank, thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, so as I suggested, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the mic back over to Mike, Michael, for a, f a, f a few minutes, and then, then I'm going to ask the others on the panel to react in any way you want uh, to anything that's been said, and then we're going to get to some questions from the audience, but I want the panel to interact with each other. But, uh, Michael, if, if in your reactions, if you can uh, also respond to this, uh, both Bob uh, and, and Jerry, to some extent, you know, talked about the pr paid prioritization issue, which seems to, you know, really be at the heart of a lot of uh, a lot of this debate when you get to the core of it. Uh, because realistically, I know you mentioned free expression or whatever, but we don't, you know, we don't really see blocking or expect to see blocking of web websites and so forth. It seems. To a lot of it to paid part of it. And, and Bob made the point, uh, I thought, you know, quite convincingly, as economists can do with his experience, that he, Bob, Bob basically posited that, you know, he talked about the two sided market and he, markets, and he said, no, I mean, the ISPs aren't going to have an incentive to really discriminate against. The smaller guys, uh, new entrants, as I understood what he was saying, that if if they had the discretion, uh, some discretion, uh, that if anything, they would be trying to seek uh, more from from the Googles and whatever. And and I think uh, the ultimate point of that is that ultimately uh, it would it would likely work out that way, and that would be better for consumers overall. Uh, so maybe in your uh, responses you can address that, and then we'll go back and forth. It'll take about 40 minutes to do all those things. <laughs> that work for everyone? Uh, yeah. So let me let me kind of try and wrap all of this together and see if I can do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, on the paid prioritization front, I think there are broadly speaking two harms or concerns. Right? One is this harm. One is this concern that um, it increases friction for new entrants for startups because on the list of things you need to do to build a new company, for example, in addition to you know, come up with an idea and execute the idea, you then have to uh, you know, potentially sort of fly around the country and play golf with, with people at ISPs, but you know, cut, find a way to cut deals with ISPs and that's going to cost you time, it's going to cost you money, and we've heard uh, from very high profile venture capitalists that if that additional barrier exists for startups, it will greatly decrease their interest in investing. And so you have kind of that category, which we could talk about for hours, but you know, that category of concern. And then I think the other category of concern, which also deals with the smaller entrants, is that in order to create a situation where the paid prioritization option, the paid option, is an attractive one, you have to have the non-paid option to be not that good. And you know, we can define that as a degradation of service or an increase in the paid prioritization service. You know, what, whatever it is, there has to be a differentiation between the, the, the unpaid and the paid services. And the concern is that there will be an incentive because you make additional money for the paid, you know, paid prioritization to make sure that that sort of standard level of service is subpar enough to justify the increased cost. Because if you don't, then no one's going to pay for the prioritization. And so with that, when you have smaller services, they, even if they're not targeted, and I don't think that ISPs are sitting around thinking about ways to kind of like destroy small services or make sure that publicknowledge.org loads slowly. I mean, maybe public knowledge loads slowly, but you know, like small services, websites load slowly. I think that in a lot of ways that, to use a cliche, that long tail of the internet, it's just, it, it's the cost of setting up the prioritization. But that's, those are kind of the two categorical things. I know uh, this seems to be frustrating other people on the panel, but we can talk about them more. In terms of kind of actual uh, things that were mentioned, and I will try and make, these, make this quick, I think you know a lot of times people talk about how 
we, we, don't, we haven't had net neutrality rules historically, and I think that's a little bit short-sighted. We had uh, the, the internet principles for a long time. We had some ISPs, large ISPs like ISP, now, like AT&T, now Comcast, operating, operating under net neutrality or net neutrality style rules as a result of merger conditions. Uh, we had the 2010 rules, and then we all also have had for, I mean, we've all, we, we, we've all been doing this a long time, some longer than others, we have had this regulatory cloud, this process cloud hanging over ISPs for uh, at least seven or eight years where everyone is operating in an environment where the FCC is either in the process of thinking about doing net neutrality, doing net neutrality, or having done net neutrality, which on some level, I believe, has disciplined the market. Now, you may disagree with that, but I think that you know, saying that there's only a small period of time where there, was, there were net neutrality rules is a little bit of a narrow reading. And even in that time, uh, we have seen, and you, you would think that we wouldn't, we wouldn't see many violations because there is that sort of either rules or threat of rules or reasons to be on best behavior. But even in that time, yeah, I mean, look, we saw Madison River. Uh, we saw the BitTorrent blocking. We also saw AT&T discriminating against FaceTime. Uh, we see Comcast uh, throttling or exempting its own online video service and making sure that competitive services don't get to pay for prioritization. We saw Netflix, we can debate whether or not it's technically a net neutrality violation, but Netflix wasn't working very well, and then they paid a bunch of money to an ISP, a lot of ISPs, and suddenly they worked pretty well. Uh, we see AT&T roll out, roll out sponsored data schemes whereby people pay for prioritization of data. Uh, we've seen Verizon tell courts, you know, but for net neutrality rules, they would be looking to expand these. We see T-Mobile exempting various services from its data cap. So we are actually seeing a high level of interest and motivation from ISPs to directly inject themselves into the relationship between their customers and edge providers. And you know, when you think about customers and differentiated pricing, we're all for differentiated pricing. I've written reams and reams on differentiated pricing. Um, I could pay more for a faster connection. I could pay less for a slower connection. Just like I've sometimes paid more for the Accela, sometimes I regret it, sometimes I don't, but it's certainly an option. But I mean, when you took the Accela here, Randy, you didn't pay an extra fee to make sure that he got actually delivered here. Um, I don't you know, know. <laughs> I might be. I'm not sure. <laughs> you may pay for the uh, ticket, but I mean. Uh, so I mean, you, you think about that prioritization. Yeah, if I'm a if I'm a consumer, I want to pay for a fast connection. But when I pay for whatever level of connection that I want, all sorts of differentiation, um, I want to get everything that I pay for, irregardless of what the the, the site I want to do has, relationship has with my ISP. Uh, and then just on the kind of, and I'll wrap right, this up. And then, yeah, because I want yes, to get yeah, to I, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, on the USF front, I think, look, a lot of this sounds like criticism of the USF system, which is a kind of different conversation. I think if there are problems with USF, there are problems with USF, regardless if broadband's involved or not. And finally, on the international front, we work, we do a lot of work with ITU as well to make sure that ITU does not get involved with broadband internet access. Um, and I also don't, I understand the argument that uh, setting an, an example is important, but I think that even in this you know, hands-off regulatory structure we've had, there are plenty of countries that are totally happy to do all sorts of things that are problematic with the internet. And when we're talking about net neutrality and broadband internet access, we're talking about the companies that connect you to the internet getting involved, not the governments that, that, that regulate the country that you're in being involved. Those are fundamentally different things. So, sorry, that's a bunch of things. No, I'll you, stop there. you uh, that was a, a lot you put on the table, and, and we uh, appreciate it. I, you're probably aware that uh, on the international front that when Phil Revere was over at the State Department as in his position as counselor, and even during the last go-round, that proposal, he made a statement that if, if this country adopted net neutrality regulations, that would be problematic for the U.S. defending, you know, the position that other countries didn't do it, but I know he's occupying a different position uh, now. Uh, 
boy, there are times when I wished I was just sitting down there and could respond. I'm going to uh, not. I'm going to defer right now to these guys. So I'm just. I see Jerry's got fingers up, but so you can go <laughs> first. But then I want Bob to have a chance and Debbie to just respond uh, to uh, or say to anyone, and you know, keep it fairly brief so we can keep it going. And because I want to have the audience involved. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Um, I, I just had this. This this thing is on YouTube. It's a John Oliver at HBO. Um, had a long thing about the internet, and, and he led it off by saying, the internet in its current form is not broken, and the FCC is currently taking steps to fix that. <laughs> so, um, there we are. Um, I, I, I loved Michael's characterization that we've really had a, a network neutrality regulation for a long time because it's always been there as a threat. We haven't actually had it, but it's been there as a threat. Uh, and if that's the story, then I would suggest we continue it as a threat. And let's not actually have it, okay? And, and just, just have it as a threat in the background. I think all of us would be happy with that. Uh, Bob, do you want to uh, well, uh, say anything? Uh, most of the uh, discussion about how there's a threat of, uh, of um, ISPs, uh, broadband distributors, carriers, discriminating against content um, is extremely superficial and lacks any sort of empirical substance. Let me, let me suggest to you, though, that there is some empirical substance to the notion that it's not very great. First of all, Time Warner spun off its Time Warner cable unit many years ago. If there is tremendous advantage to, to uh, uh, favoring your own content and making money from doing that, they wouldn't have done it. Disney doesn't own uh, d d distributors. Uh, Comcast bought NBC, and if you look carefully at uh, what's happened to the market cap of Comcast relative to other cable companies and other media companies, I would argue that probably they've lost money on that transaction so far. That is, that they have not, that their, the purchase price of about $30 billion for NBC was probably not worth it. Because the Comcast owning NBC confers no advantage on NBC because they can't use that content in any advantageous way that they couldn't do through, through licensing the content themselves. And in fact, uh, there's very little evidence that there's a potential uh, for that, uh, for discrimination that would va increase the value of NBC. So I think we see lots of empirical evidence that that's uh, not, uh, that, that the threat is, is not very great. And this anecdotal stuff may work in Washington, but I don't think it works in the real world. Are you uh, trying to suggest that facts actually matter here? Is that what you were doing? Well, I'm, I'm in Washington, so I'm not sure I should do that. It's crazy you know. that, 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 the, that the plot of these things I'm mentioning haven't occurred in the real world, that they're only happening in Washington? I'm suggesting to you that you have a few anecdotes, but it is not a, a uh, empirical evidence that there's a systematic tendency for these distributors to be able to, much less have the incentive to, uh, to uh, discriminate and make money from doing it. Just as I, suge just as I suggested earlier that the uh, uh, Netflix, Netflix negotiating these paid prioritization agreements will pr did not reduce the value of Netflix's stock. I and mean, the reason is, uh, to the extent they have to pay more to get decent distribution of Hollywood films, they'll pay less for the Hollywood films. Okay, now I want to, Debbie, I'm going to give you a chance in just a minute, but I want to pose, here's a real world, if we want to talk about the real world, uh, example that, that Michael brought up that I think illustrates to me, you know, when the, uh, a consequence of what what may happen if we have this type of regulation. Uh, because if we just pose the question, you know, and uh, let's be honest about it, most of those comments that we talk about filed at the FCC, the millions, they, they said we, you know, in favor of an open internet, I suppose. A lot of them did. There were about 800,000 that no one mentions. Maybe you guys, the various committees. 800,000 that said they were uh, against this regulation. But here's, Michael mentioned the T-Mobile plan, the zero rated plans. And he and I've had this discussion, but let, let's have it a little bit here. T-Mobile has introduced a plan uh, whereby you can go to certain music sites, uh, only music sites, you know, not poetry sites, you know, which, which I like, but you, you go to those music sites and the, it, 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 the uh, access is not counted towards your cap for those sites. And Sprint, by God, you know, and these are the two you know, what they call the upstarts, you know, the upstarts that are backed by giant companies, 
they happen to be overseas. But, but they, the, Sprint has a plan, as you may know, that for $10 per month, you can access Facebook, but not other uh, internet sites. And then for another $5, you can add Twitter. Another $5, you can add another site, you know, or, or something like that. So, so uh, a couple things. It, it would seem to me that these sites, and I think that it's being proven true because they still use, would be attractive to consumers and especially low income consumers who might find that an attractive entry point, you know, to the mobile broadband world for $10. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, they, they obviously discriminate uh, because you can't go to MySpace for that $5. You can go to, uh, what's it called, Facebook. Now, so they discriminate, and therefore, uh, Michael and, and others that are the title to advocates, the stringent title to advocates, they uh, are opposed to these plans. Uh, I've had, well, now he's, well, I've been hammering with this for a couple of months. Maybe now he's, maybe he's not so op opposed well, to it. Well, T-Mobile, yes, but, Sprint's a different animal. Okay, but what I, you know, the, the point is that uh, most consumers, I think, uh, uh, overall, uh, find these, would at least appreciate having the option of, of having these plans. And, and, you know, they're not harmful. Most title to advocates, maybe you're changing, but uh, they oppose these plans. So that's a real world example, whereas, you know, if you're, are you in favor of the open internet? Well, maybe not if it means that T-Mobile can't ask that, offer that plan at Sprint. So uh, I know Debbie has always been concerned about low income consumers in, the, in other contexts. Maybe she'll want to speak to that. Uh, why don't, you, and, and then Michael, you two can address that. Okay, well, I wanted to share a quote first back to, I think it was around 06 of Senator Dorgan, who said, new services like Google couldn't get started in a system with price discrimination. Obviously, they've had no problem getting started, right? And so um, I was glad that Michael did bring up the principles because we have had those principles. And actually, in some of these cases, the threat is a chairman picking up the telephone and calling and saying, we may have to open a proceeding, right? And so part of this is also about when there is a very real and present danger that is definable, that is a true complaint where a consumer of a, or a group of consumers have been harmed. And then the FCC could look at that. In every case, uh, basically something has either gotten agreed to or the um, whatever the issue was has absolutely stopped. The one thing that we haven't talked about and I've got to bring up is this whole concept of transparency, which Michael has brought up. I think it's really important. I was excited to hear all of these choices. I didn't even know they were out there. Um, but this brings up the AT&T throttling case that the FTC has been investigating and the fact that they are the expert agency. Again, if Title II goes into effect, then the FTC will not be able to do those investigations. They are our nation's expert agency for every sector, you know, across all sectors. And so I think it's really important that in terms of the advertising and what consumers are being told they're going to get and whether or not there are deceptive practices, that that needs to stay at the FTC, which is another repercussion, if right. you will, of Title II regulation. Right. And I think what Debbie's referring to is if there's a classification of uh, the ISPs as uh, carriers, then it's thought by most, most people uh, <coughs> that that would divest the FTC of jurisdiction. Now, Michael, here's what I want to do. I'm actually uh, trying to be generous. If yeah. you have, so that's fine. So maybe that'll give us an opportunity now to see whether the audience has questions. I'm going to ask you to identify yourself, uh, uh, say who you're with, uh, direct your question. Uh, first, you, you'll be next. This gentleman put his hand up first. Uh, and uh, De Kathy Baker is going to give you the mic. Now, look, here's, here's, here's the rule on questions, though. We don't 
uh, please make a long statement because we want to get in several people question. have questions. Just to ask a ask a question, uh, and if you need to make a statement, couple it very quickly in that question. Right. Quick statement and quick question then. Bruno Basalisco from uh, Copenhagen Economics, and that's uh, not Copenhagen, New York. It's actually Copenhagen, Denmark. So. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry for saying anything about Denmark. No, no, <laughs> it, it Why is don't a, you stand up? Sure, sure. We are. A, <laughs> what are the chances? We are a small, specialized <laughs> economic consultancy uh, working across uh, the world, but based in Northern Europe. And actually, Northern Europe is more um, free market and enterprising than you think about. At least, it's more free market and enterprising than the French. But uh, <laughs> that's easy. And um, we're we in France. <laughs> We wrote a report on uh, comparing the US and Europe uh, last year, so come talk to me if you're interested in that. And we did find out that uh, there are concerns indeed about what regulation does to investment incentives in, uh, in Europe. And um, uh, it's always fruitful, I think, when we compare different, uh, different systems, because I think there's always uh, room for learning from uh, each, each, uh, each of its own uh, um, advantages and, and uh, disadvantages. And, um, um, I, I note that um, Title II feels like a, um, from, from a European perspective, like a um, sledgehammer, perhaps sledgehammer and nut come to mind, uh, given the, the problems you, you, you may or may not uh, be discussing here. The, the, the point is that the beef in Europe, when we think about the regulatory regime and telecommunications on broadband in Europe, the beef ends up being not so much about net neutrality, but more about resale and the price setting. This is where a whole of the energy of the regulators is, uh, is, is invested on. As a former uh, chief economist team uh, member in uh, Ofcom, one of the largest UK, uh, regulators in Europe, that's where I've, we've seen the action. And my question to the panel is the, fo is the following. Uh, we observe in Europe that even where the regulator thinks that uh, it would be justified to uh, forbear or allow price increases, um, in many cases, regulation has a life of its own. There's a community of stakeholders that has an interest in regulation, so it is almost impossible for the regulator to um, take back what was given. So it doesn't okay. feel like an experiment, it feels like an irreversible decision. Would okay. the same happen in the US if the FCC go, goes down this way? That's my question. Okay, who wants to take it? Bob? The, the European situation is very different from the US one. First of all, the European Commission has now admitted that it has done a very bad job in, uh, in uh, leading the regulatory process in Europe, but uh, it's done an equally bad job of resolving how to fix it. Uh, has done absolutely nothing in that regard. And as a result, it hasn't even uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, enforced its own regulations on member countries. I believe Spain and Portugal have now uh, overtly, the regulators have overtly decided to deregulate uh, fiber, allowing both Telefonica and Portuguese uh, uh, Telecom to begin to deploy fiber. They're two of the few ILEX in Europe that are doing so. So in the, Europe is really a, a federation the way uh, the Federal Society would like to see it here, uh, where the, 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 the central government is becoming less and less powerful in telecom. Excuse me. Uh, one of the facts that I found when uh, Randy called me about being here was that the EU cookie rate, the, the cookie rule that the EU has promulgated has ended up costing over $2 billion. I don't know if you have any idea about that. And then also I want to congratulate Denmark because you do not, you do, don't show up on my throttling slide that I wanted to show where the U.S. is actually down at 29th. I think that's 29. Um, and the countries that we that we think of as the most uh, innovative, uh, forward-thinking, at, at least in terms of technology and devices, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, Philippines, are all throttling at this amount. So I just wanted you to know what a great job we are doing here in the U.S. And Denmark doesn't even show up. <laughs> uh, Michael, did you want to say anything about Europe? Uh, no, I mean, it's, I, you know. Okay, uh, so do you still have a question here? Wait just a minute for the mic. Hello, my name is Deborah Lathan. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Deborah. Um, I was at the FCC uh, during the, if you all remember, the open access days. Uh, I am now currently running my own consulting practice. And I have a question for Michael and then for the panel, so I'll go quickly. Michael, I'd like for you to just talk a little bit about the argument that is made that there will be no investment if Title II happens, and clearly the Silicon Valley companies will want the broadband providers to invest, so I'd like for you to um, address that. Um, and also to address the question of, let's assume that the two mergers, AT&T and Comcast, are approved, would it be sufficient 
if the net neutrality principles are placed in those mergers and therefore the FCC could sort of let the net neutrality rulemaking put it to the side since the two major broadband providers in the country would be covered by that. And then for the panel, my question is this. Um, Verizon sort of opened a Pandora box with their victory in court, and then the president sort of put the FCC in, in a box, I mean, in a bind. So my question to the panel is, given the fact, I mean, how does the FCC get out of this box that it's in actually being required to, 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 classify, uh, net, to classify broadband services because they're caught between the Verizon decision and the president? Okay. Well, they those are big, big questions, and you know we'll just have to tackle them briefly, uh, probably. Michael, you you can go yeah, first. Great. Yes. No. No. Um, uh, yeah. So on the um, on, on the merger condition question, I think look, merger conditions are not a substitute for for categorical rules. Um, so that's that. Um, as for the investment question, I mean, look, we. We see threats to stop investment from ISPs, from regulated entities generally outside the telecommunications space all the time. Uh, I'm not convinced that what we've seen, that we're actually going to see any of that follow through for whatever that's worth. Um, you know, we've seen, there are studies, my colleagues at Free Press have done studies that certainly strong net neutrality rules have not deterred investment by ISPs. And I think the FCC's theory of, of, the, of the virtuous cycle is a reasonable one, which is what you see is with strong net neutrality rules, you see development of new services, which drives demand for better, faster broadband connections, which drives investment, which drives the creation of new services. And so there's not a reason to think right now that we wouldn't continue to see that. You know, I recognize that AT&T announced that they were pausing their fiber deployment. A lot of people had considered that fiber deployment, you know, fiber to the press release. And so there's an <laughs> open question. I don't, I, AT&T doesn't tell me what their internal plans are, so I know that's a shock. But uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but, but that was not something that made us pause and say, well, we need to rethink this entire enterprise. Uh, you economist have a... I'd be happy to talk about that issue as to uh, how Tom Wheeler gets out of his current uh, problem. I have no idea. I don't have a JD degree, nor have I, uh, am I sitting uh, close to uh, political power. Um, but as for the effect of regulation on investment, more and more economic, serious econometric studies are coming out showing a severe effect of various forms of telecom regulation adverse effect on investment. I have no reason to believe that if we go down this road, it won't have some effect. It'll, fortunately for the advocates, it'll take 10 years for the data to, to arrive and for the econometricians to go to work on it. So you got a 10-year uh, uh, lull here before uh, the evidence becomes clear that what you've done is to reduce uh, network investment in the United States. Jerry. Um, I think Tom Wheeler is going to do what every politician has to do in this, which is to say, wait. <laughs> okay. Uh, eventually, you know, Obama's going to go away. Okay. And, um, you know, th this whole thing about letters to the FCC is going to subside, and the FCC is going to take an action. It's probably going to be less than a year from now, but so certainly no sooner than six months. That's what you have to do in this case. You've got to wait till the heat goes down, and that's what he's got to do. Um, I would also say, <clears throat> Deborah Latham. When Deborah and I were at the FCC, and uh, we were working a case. Do you remember the AOL Time Warner case? Yeah, that's what we were working. Okay, and we were in the chairman's office with. Okay. Understand. Okay, and um, uh, at one point, someone I won't say who mentioned that um, in order to accomplish an objective of the FCC we should put a condition on this merger. And Deborah perked up and said, wait a minute, that condition is not merger specific. Yeah. And the other person Let's said, give her some of them. Yeah. <laughs> the other person said, yeah, well, this is something we want. <laughs> and you can believe Deborah didn't take that lying down, OK? And I would suggest the same thing here. This does not sound like a merger specific proposal to do. So I am actually surprised that you raised this, Deborah. <laughs> yes. Could I? It's a question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's my answer. 
It's what they call a rhetorical question yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. By the way, I'd like to say a bit about the AOL Time Warner merger is a very interesting uh, example. Um, uh, there were pe serious people. As a matter of fact, I had, uh, I won't mention the name, but I had uh, a meeting with a CEO of a Silicon Valley firm whose net worth today is greater than the sum probably of all the people in this room squared. Uh, and he was, of, he was of, 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 the, of the opinion that if something didn't, wasn't done about that merger, AOL Time Warner was going to take over the entire space of, of media and communications in the United States. Think how silly that sounds today. And all this sort of anecdotal speculation about what might occur but for Title II regulation of the Internet, I think is going to uh, go the same way. Well, I've, I've got a collection of those. I mean, actually, they put out a press release with uh, uh, Michael's predecessor firm and Media Access Project and Consumers Union and uh, Consumer Federation of America. And uh, I think there may have been one more, but, but talking about the unthinkable, you, th you thought the world was going to end if those, you know, uh, if that merger were allowed to go through. And, and of course, the the whole theme of that was that this merged company would control both, of course, the, same, the transmission pipe and the content if that were allowed to go through. And you know what? You've, I've, I've got that. Uh, you, it's, it, you can still find it. It's getting harder on, on the web if you search for it. But, but you would have thought uh, that if that merger were approved, that that was the end of the Internet as we know it, as some people like to talk about. But Thankfully, that didn't occur then. Randy, um, so most everybody knows, and I was not a fan of, uh, of merger conditions, but yes, I ended up voting for a few. Um, but Comcast, the behemoth of our nation, is under the net neutrality condition until 2018. So to Jerry's point, the chairman could just push it off. And I think that if I were the chairman, I would talk about these three figures. $1.3 trillion of investment, $75 billion in 2013 alone, and 11 million jobs. So I think that would be my ma mantra. Okay. Uh, well, I think we've got time for just one more question. Uh, uh, because this press club does discriminate in price. If you, I have at least until 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, but at some point I might get a higher bill. So I'm going to uh, turn to Anna Maria. If she asks a very quick question I, and a quick answer, I might give you a chance, but okay. not necessarily. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Kovacs, and I'm with the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Um, my question, like so many others, is for Michael. Um, you talked at length about uh, why you don't want paid prioritization. One can agree or disagree with you, but uh, not only Commissioners O'Reilly and Pai, but the Chairman have all said that Title II does not prevent paid prioritization. So what's the point of this whole exercise? <laughs> this is kind of a great panel. I get to talk all the time. <laughs> yeah, so I think that there's, there's an important, briefly. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll pay a little extra. Yeah, no. <laughs> get this, I've been waiting for this. I don't, I don't need to run up the bill. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's an important distinction between thinking of Title II as an, as an ends and Title II as a means, right? Title II is not sort of a self-executing decision that then, that then takes care of all of this. Um, and it's absolutely true that under Title II, the FCC has plenty of leeway to write horrible net neutrality rules that do nothing that we're advocating for, right? That allow all sorts of paid partization and all these things. Um, the reason, the, the purpose of the exercise the reason that we're pushing so hard for Title II is that we believe that under Title II, the FCC then has the ability to declare certain activity by ISPs categorically unjust and unreasonable in a way that they cannot do under 706 under the, the DC Circuit's opinion. And so the purpose of the exercise to advocate around Title II isn't because title, we get Title II and then we can kind of go home. The purpose of the exercise is to then enable the commission in a legally sound way 
to make the kind of categorical rules against blocking, against throttling, against discrimination that, uh, that, we, that we're urging. But I will absolutely concede the point immediately and over and over that Title II in and of itself does not guarantee that outcome. Okay. I'd like, I'd like to ahead. just uh, add to that, that regardless of what Chairman uh, Wheeler says about whether paid prioritization is legal or not, it's not going to be in, in, uh, in his ballpark to determine that. It'll be the future c commissions and the courts. And what we can be sure of is whatever comes out of this is going to take years. Mm -hmm. it, isn't, it isn't going to be something that just the FCC chairman is going to say, this is okay, let's go ahead. It's going to be after another 5, 10, 15 years of, uh, of litigation and, and uh, carriers petitioning for getting higher rates for termination and, and so forth. So I, I don't think uh, that's any solace that uh, Wheeler says that paid prioritization could be legal under Title II. Okay, I think what we're going to do uh, now is end it. And I want to, uh, Michael, since I, uh, you spoke next to last, I want to thank you for coming. As you probably know, uh, or you may know, I, th I think, that before uh, your former colleague Gigi Sohn went to the FCC, uh, she was a frequent uh, participant at Free State Foundation events. In fact, I asked her to as well for this one. Uh, so, but I'm glad that you came. It, I think everyone here will agree we had a terrific discussion. I think very informative, very enlightening. I thank Bob, Jerry, and uh, Debbie, and, and I guess, uh, on Bob's note, uh, I guess I have to say we'll probably do it again sometime, probably. <laughs> Join me in thanking them.